we are in Sydney, episode 13 of the Network Podcast. We're here with Richard Kavanagh. Thanks for welcoming us to your home. Thanks for, for being here, boys. Beautiful place. Beautiful. That's awesome. It's really, really a privilege to be here and chat to you today. Yeah, Get in the fight insights. cave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, careful what I say, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah. no, thanks so much for coming on. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to have you, um, especially, you know, having all our chats off camera earlier one of the more insightful and creative minds in the industry in australia right now if even globally worldwide so um get a little bit of a insight into you for our listeners i guess a lot of people who listen to our po- podcast are i would say primarily barbers yeah. mm. um who might not know mm. who richard Kavanagh is what you do mm. so you want to give yourself a brief introduction well before i introduce myself do you know i worked in a barber shop uh Way back before barbering was cool, right? Like yeah. in, um, I finished my apprenticeship and I was a proper scallywag. I was like a very, I was, I'm lucky I'm here today to tell the story. To be honest, <laughs> I was that much of a scallywag. Um, and I sort of opted out of my hairdressing apprenticeship. I needed money. There was a local barber shop, and it was Diddy Burford's barber shop in Birkenhead in Auckland. And Diddy Burford was this old, old dude. And what he what had happened was he opened a barber shop, and then World War Two came along, right? So he put a padlock on the door and went off to Europe for six years to fight in World War Two. Came home from Europe, took the barber uh, padlock off the door, <laughs> and went back into the barber shop. Wow. And I was there. When I was uh, uh, 18, I think. And so that was a long, 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 long time after World War II. And Diddy Burford was a doddery old dude at that point. And he still came in every single morning at 6 a.m. to do haircuts. He'd come in for three hours every morning, seven days a week. And he had the old man like shakes, you know, the, the old yeah, wrist shakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he'd get the cutthroat out and his hands would jiggle like that and he'd get to the neck and the blade would touch the skin smooth as silk <laughs> but there's no fucking way that guy was going anywhere near me for yeah. a haircut <laughs> <laughs> nah away. I'm not doing that um, so I worked in this barber shop and it was a barber shop and tobacconist uh, three chairs no waiting like I think it was like 650 650 750 or 850 for a haircut that was it those were your options wow and you'd do a haircut you'd get them in and out in 10 minutes give them a, a coloured ticket and they'd take that to the girl at the front counter and she'd put it on your spike and at the end of the day, they should count up all the tickets on your spike and then give you your percentage of cash wow. that should take into the haircuts. Wow. We've come a long way, haven't we? We have. <laughs> <laughs> but that was classic old school barber tobacconist, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that, 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 that kind of died out. And then there was this resurgence of barber shops, mm. you know, probably 15 years ago with the likes of a couple of those kind of high profile outfits that kicked up in new york and you know yeah. then worldwide it's been a real big thing right? yeah absolutely i think like a couple of years back like the, the Rusel guys and stuff over in amsterdam and yeah they went wild didn't they mm. over there it yeah. was really yeah. the culture came back in from that old school type of vibe and yep kicked back up again but now it's, it's even moving in a different direction now again yeah. i see i see the hairdressing and barbering kind of almost amalgamating a little bit there is a lot more of that you know i think there's a lot more crossover into like if you go into a salon there's a lot more people having barbering skills mm. and i remember a few years back i was where oh, shall i introduce myself yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we'll backtrack a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. let's go back <laughs> yeah. look um uh, my name's richard Kavanagh. i've been in the hairdressing industry since i was a teenager at high school um to be honest i wanted to be a chemist i wanted to be a biochemist but i was really into art as well and one day when I was a, a, a young kid, I was having my hair colored. I was kind of like this new wave punk thing. I was having my hair colored and cut into this crazy 80s new wave kind of post-punk look. And the girl was explaining the science of hair coloring. And then she was explaining the architecture of hair cutting, like how you can approach hair cutting in, a, in an architectural way, in a sculptural way. And I was like, it was like someone hit me between the eyes with a hammer. I'm like, mm. that's it. I'm doing hair. That's the one. I'm doing hair. And I went home and told my mum and she was like, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but I convinced her eventually and um, she was like, well, the only way you're going to do that is if you're going to do an apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I did my apprenticeship in uh, Auckland. It actually took me a really long time to get through my apprenticeship because like I said, I was a bit of a scallywag. Um, it took me seven years to finish. Not that I, like, like the weird thing is I would go to 
in those days, every six months we would go to Polytechnic for two weeks to do theory. And we'd have to do like, you know, uh, design drawing, human anatomy, uh, mm -hmm. all the theory, right? Like mm -hmm. um, chemistry, biology, technical, like finger waving, permit, everything. And uh, in all my mock-up exams, I would get 100% and I'd finish them in like half an hour when we had two hours to do them and I'd just fuck around for the next, you know, 90 minutes. But um, I just never did my exams, my actual exams. I just yeah. did the mock-ups. And so I fucked around for about seven years, got into lots of trouble. I found martial arts. That got me on the right track. Went back and worked in a barber shop, funnily enough, again, and got myself back on my feet. Uh, f sort of finished my apprenticeship, opened my own salon, decided that was not for me. I wanted to have a crack at some sort of something bigger. Uh, so I moved to kind of like a, a bigger award-winning salon in the city, entered some hair competitions, did pretty good with those, sort of won everything I went into. And that gave me opportunities to become a platform artist, represent some of the brands, travel the world a bit. And then one of the photographers that I'd worked with doing photo shoot competitions was like, oh, like I really like the way you do hair. Do you want to come and do some work on photo shoots? And I was like, yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, the first time he, he rang me up and said, hey, we're going to do this shoot. Um, we're going to go to Queenstown. We're going to go down for a week. We're going to shoot three stories. Everything's paid for. Um, I'm like, yeah, mate, I'm in. You know, you don't have to sell me. I'm in. I'm 100%. Book me in. I'm coming. I'm canceling all my clients. And then as I'm hanging up the phone, and bear in mind, this is pre-Instagram, pre-mobile phones, pre-internet, right? So it's like phone with a fucking cord, mm -hmm. yellow pages. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm about to hang up the phone. So excited. I've just booked my first photo shoot, right? This is my transition from salon to session world. And he goes, oh, you do makeup as well, right? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Put the phone down and then I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? Holy shit. Wow. So anyway, I buy some bits and pieces of makeup. I turn up, I do the shoot. I have no idea what I'm doing with the makeup, but I, I kill it with the hair. We get the cover of the magazine. Magazine comes out. People start ringing me up, booking me. Different photographers booking me for hair and makeup jobs. Wow. And pretty much within six months of doing my first shoot, I'm doing big billboard campaigns, big global campaigns, covers editorial celebrity work and i'm like the whole time i'm crapping my pants every single day because i don't know how to do makeup i'm like <laughs> what the fuck am i doing here anyway after about six months one of the photographers who's now my wife by the way that i used to work with said to me i, I she was booking me for a shoot and i was like listen do you think it'd be all right if we got someone else to do the makeup because well, like i'm you know I, I, i'm i want to do the hair but i just i feel a bit don't feel like I can do the, the, the makeup justice. And she's like, oh my God, I'm so glad you've said that because you do amazing <laughs> hair, but your makeup's always a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, uh, awesome. you know, that was my kind of foray into session world. Um, I transitioned in uh, year 99 to full-time working in, sash in session. Um, and that's been my career basically ever since. So, along that journey uh, I think we talked about this off air I've kind of I've basically been the guy that says yes to everything that comes along and so my careers I've always been a hairdresser I've always been a session stylist and I've had these little kind of side roads that I've gone down of being a tv presenter of being an actor of you know being a tree surgeon but still always doing hair um and uh uh, it's been my passion, you know, I've been lucky enough to travel the world. I've done all the big shows. Uh, I was in Guido's team for a few years. We did Prada, Versace, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren. You know, I've shot Vogue covers. I've shot big A-list celebrities, Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, you know, all the different Vogues around the world. Um, my number one goal as a session stylist was to shoot, a, 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 an Italian Vogue beauty story. Mm -hmm. um, I managed to do that a couple of times uh, to get a Vogue cover was a big goal for me I've done that a few times and uh, I, I think that you know like I've been lucky enough I've just ticked all those goals and a few years ago we started a technology company and now I find myself I'm still a hairdresser but I'm now the CEO of a technology company which is super weird for me to say but it's what I do now. It's crazy. Such a, it's a, <laughs> what a story. Such an awesome story. 
I, could I, just, I just want to wrap it up there. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> we can't top that now. I think um, something that I'm seeing in there, though, like where, where did the where did the um, kind of confidence to say yes to everything come from? Is was there a pivotal moment in your life where you can? Where do you think that came from? Because that that's common, isn't it? Right throughout your whole career, like even now, mm. like you know, it, with the technology stuff, you're like, oh, and this is where I found myself. It's like. It's like yeah, saying That's, yes that makes and sense figuring it because out. Because you know? you're the guy that does, all right, bring on, you know. What do you think that is? Ah, oh, that's a good question, man. I reckon it's a combination of things, right? Like it's it's one part stupidity and naivety. <laughs> yep. You know, it's just like, yep. a, so I kind of have this, I have this philosophy in life and I, I learned this fairly early on. I think I picked this up through fighting and in my innate nature, right? So my, my, my nature... We moved around quite a lot when I was a kid, so I had to kind of learn how to make friends quite quickly. And it was a really good skill to have. And, and at the time, I didn't like it very much, but, you know, it, it served me well because I can, I can easily just kind of meet people and be quite relaxed about who I am and, you know, be quite comfortable with myself and know that who I am is not going to change based on external circumstances. Um, so that's kind of part of my innate nature. But when I started fighting... I realized that, um, I, I don't think I mentioned this in my intro, but I, I did martial arts. So I got my black belt in karate in 92. I fought full contact bare knuckles, open weight tournaments. Uh, I boxed, I was a golden gloves boxing champion. Uh, and then I transitioned to, um, jujitsu through MMA and now I do jujitsu. Uh, yeah, awesome. and so through that, I think what I've learned is that, and it's kind of at the heart of the philosophy of everything I do is that everybody gets up in the morning out of bed after sleeping and they go to the toilet and they have something to eat and they put their pants on and then they go about their day, right? Nobody is any different in that respect. And so I've got this kind of thing in my head that if you are a person and you can do something, I am a person too. Therefore, I can do that thing, Yeah. right? Um, even if I don't know how to do it, I know that I can learn. Yeah, you can yeah. figure it out. We, we have that philosophy. That's amazing. We just talk, we talk about that almost weekly. Yeah. Um, and something that I like to help people with in the academy is like, it's almost learning a good learning philosophy. Like you yes. need, almost you need to learn to learn. Yes. And if, if you can do that, you can pretty much do anything. Exactly. You know, I mean, there's some limitations, obviously. Some might be some biological limitations, but for most things, if you can learn, you can do most mm. things. Well, I'm never going to play in the NBA, right? I'm not a basketball player. Never say never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, biologically, <laughs> I'm very challenged on that one. <laughs> you know? 6'2", <two>, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm 6'2 on the inside. It's, uh, <laughs> it's my personality. <laughs> but I think that's, a, a, you know, when you think about, let's say, your, your fighting um, kind of history... And getting into that space, it kind of teaches you like the challenges of overcoming certain things, and like it's the principles and the behind that mm. is what kind of drives things forward. And well, it's the principle of learning skills, and to your to your point, Lee, of making like learning how to learn, right? Like mm. when you learn new skills, you learn how to learn, and then you realize I know how to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a uh, Funakshi Gishin's the the uh, Okinawan character that brought what was Okinawa te to the universities of Japan, which became karate. And uh, the Okinawans had this kind of martial art that they weren't allowed to practice because they were under feudal law from Japan, and the the feudal uh, Japanese um, government didn't allow the Okinawans to practice any martial arts. And so they had this thing that they used to practice at nighttime, and then as things opened up. Uh, Gishin Funakshi brought it to the, the universities of Japan and started teaching Okinawa te, which became karate, mm -hmm. or karate as they call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, but he had this list of precepts, right? The 20 precepts of Gishin Funakushi. And one of them says that um, uh, true mastery, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically true mastery happens when the learner and the learning become one, mm -hmm. right? And Incredible. so it's, it's, a, it's this thing of like, if you have a passion for learning and you learn how to learn, like you guys as, as, as coaches and teachers and leaders, if you can help people learn how to learn, it doesn't matter what they learn. Yeah. They're going to have the ability to be self-sufficient. And that's where we're kind of at with hair now. It's like hair is like our key to the door to mm. like help people 
live better lives to, mm. to a degree because your story is very interesting when it comes to that because it's like you've gone down all these different paths and like yeah. the seasons of your life I guess like we spoke about as well off camera it's like the seasons of your life can be can look so different yeah. but you still have the skill of hair that ties back into that when you needed to or when you wanted to yeah well um, that's the thing right there's a difference between skills and like like skills are something you can learn yeah right and and everything you do requires certain skills like we were talking about that off camera we we're talking about the idea of your life going through seasons rather than being this linear process of being born going to school choosing a career getting a vocation and then going and having this job and then you know being this kind of linear thing mm. i love that idea of being seasonal right there's a season what's that fucking song oh, it's a terrible song i hate it there is a season blam 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 <laughs> no nah, anyway i shouldn't Definitely oh, yeah. shouldn't sing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, no, I don't nah, recognize nah, that. Nah. <laughs> what the fuck song is that? <laughs> Stick to her, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a very oh. good singer. Oh, yeah. In my own head. <laughs> but that's it. It comes the back shower. to the mindset. In the of, shower. You know, yeah. you can learn. Yeah, you can learn. You can go get lessons, learn how to sing. Nah. <laughs> it's never I used to play in a band, right? I played drums when I was a kid and, and, and in my early twenties I played in like band and covers bands and stuff. And I used to have um I used to have a microphone like this where I could join in the banter with the rest of the band. <laughs> and at one and I used to sing along when they were singing, right? And at one point, I remember the singer just kind of like poking his ear <laughs> with his finger and kind of frowning and trying to figure out where this weird tone was coming from that he couldn't quite relate to. Uh, and turned out it was me singing into my mic. So they took my mic off me. So what I'd do is I'd get down and I'd sing into my, my snare drum mic. <laughs> what? <laughs> Until they took all the mics off my drum kit. Oh, wow. All right, we'll leave oh. you singing out then. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know that point, there's a season and someone wrote a terrible song about it, which was a big hit in the 60s, I think. And it was, there was a season, turn, turn, turn. And I think the idea that your life... Yes, your life goes through seasons and uh, and your life meanders down, you know, roads that you may not know what the outcome of what you're doing is going to be or how it's going to be relevant to you. And I was sharing with you guys off camera, you know, like I got asked to, I had a mate who was a client who was producing a TV show about fashion and he asked me, would, would, it, would you be okay if I put you forward as the presenter of fashion because you work in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, I had a mohawk, I had tattoos. And by the way, that was before tattoos were a prerequisite for being a hairdresser, right? Yeah. It, was, it was kind of frowned upon. It was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about that. I nearly got fired for my first tattoo, actually, when I got my print, when oh, I got my wow, first tattoo yeah. doing my apprenticeship. Um, but he asked me if I'd do that. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. And um, they, they, they auditioned me for the show. And then they liked me on the show. I got the gig and... I was presenting fashion, talking about fashion and beauty and stuff that I knew about. It was easy for me because I knew about it. It was my everyday, right? They liked me and they gave me like a, a another segment on the show, which was a tech segment. And then they liked me. So then they said, do you want your own? We're, we're doing this flagship show. It's a home renovation show. Um, we want you to host it. And I'm like, sure. And then I walked away. I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know how to be a TV show host. <laughs> So then I go and do acting lessons and so I can learn how to be a TV show host and then I end up in acting in films because someone saw me working, then I get an agent and I start doing auditions and I end up in, you know, Peter Jackson's King Kong and a couple of other films working with Academy Award winners and wow. learning so much. But the, the thing is, like, you might go, why would you go and do that? Because what the hell has that got to do with doing here? Yeah. But as a session stylist, I have had so many... Uh, I'm going to tell you this funny story. I've had so many experiences where I need to speak on camera. Mm. And, you know, backstage, one of the roles of a hair director, one of the roles of a session stylist is being a brand spokesperson, being a media spokesperson for the brand, for the client, and to speak to both the industry and the consumer about hair trends, products, etc. So having the knowledge and the ability to be able to speak on camera allowed me to do that like at a very professional level without a lot of time. And so first time they point a camera at me and I can go, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And they go, 
that was really good. Mm -hmm. And they don't know that I've got that experience, mm -hmm. right? They just yeah. see me, I'm a hairdresser, I'm working, but I can speak on camera. And so all of a sudden money starts to come because brands go, we want you to be a brand spokesperson because you're a good spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to your point, right? Like we, what were we talking about? You went past the Apple store, you went and did a keynote yeah, workshop. Yeah, right? we, we, were, yeah. we were just going past the Apple store and um, <clears throat> this first time I'd ever seen it, they were doing lessons, you know, how to use the, the, all the different tools and things. And we were like, let's, let's go and do a keynote lesson one day just randomly you, know, you just in. never Let's know where it. it's going to serve you later in, yeah. in your life you know yeah. like you just never know like some people will look at lee and i and do doing certain workshops or doing different things and they're like why are you doing that for it's got nothing yeah. to do with what you're doing now but it's like but it's adding to our skills repertoire like we're, we're starting that skill stacking skill process stack, yeah. where skill stacking you like that one i do i like that yeah. a lot <laughs> man i'm gonna take i'm gonna use that yeah I'm gonna, true. I'm gonna say, look, I got this one from Owen and Lee. Skill <laughs> it's stacking. Good. It's good. I it's like good. it. I, and I got that one from, I think it was from Stephen. We listened to a guy called yeah. Stephen Bartlett. We preach about him religiously on this podcast, but Life we changer. listened to his podcast and mm. he talks about that. And it's just about all these different skills that you have mm. that accumulate to and leading to more opportunities. Mm. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if one day we get asked to do stuff like that too, you know? Well, exactly. Um, and they'll, because of how we can speak, or they might ask us to, to present awards or do anything. Yeah. You wouldn't know. You just well, never know where it could go. So here's the thing, right? You guys have taken it upon yourself to build this podcast. And you've reached out and you've found people to talk to and to interview. And you will learn as you go conversation skills, interview. Like we think we know how to converse, right? We think as... And as hairdressers, that's like one of our secret superpowers, right? Just having a yak. Mm -hmm. But... Speaking in a kind of a a, a, um, a format, if you like, where there are going to be listeners outside at another time requires certain skills. Yeah. And those skills can only be developed by doing. So by you guys doing this, you end up developing a whole lot of ancillary skills, skill stacking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that will serve you in other areas. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Something that I noticed there with, with you as well, you seem to have a good relationship with the acting thing or something like that. You know, you'd be like, oh. I'm, I'm not supposed to be that person. Uh -huh. You know, you have a good relationship with that, I feel. You know? Yeah. And like, I wonder where that comes from as that's well. That's the stupidity part. You know? <laughs> it's, yeah, but, but that's the naivety. And I, I give Owen a lot of credit for that, you know, especially in our industry, yeah. um, is he come in with like, just no bias or no preconceived idea of like what was supposed to happen. Yeah. And it was that naivety of like, yeah. and, and that I think is why, so many great ideas and great things have come from what we've been doing mm. is, is part of that. Like having a little bit of that naivety is yeah. fantastic. Well, it's also kind of like not putting, um, like not putting preconceived societal norms, ideals of what should and should not. I, I love this. I have the saying, I, I try not to should on myself. Mm. Right. What I mean right. by that is like, I should do this. I shouldn't do that. Mm. I, if I catch myself shooting on myself, I remind myself, hey, what are you doing, bro? Mm. It's yeah. like the whole like, imposter syndrome thing as well. I feel like you don't have that. Oh, <laughs> fuck no, like, bro. Like, do you have it? Fuck yeah. And of I, course. I, but I feel but like... But it's how you deal with it. It's, yeah. I think that's... we all have it, but it's how you... St like, it's that whole yeah. stepping into responsibility and not wanting because... to be disappointed in yourself by not taking an yeah. opportunity. Yeah. I think that's what it comes to. For me, it's like, well somebody asks me to do something it might scare the shit out of me yeah. on the inside yeah. but nobody will know on the outside and I think, i'll just be like all right well i'm just gonna have to give it a crack then and what's the yeah. worst that can happen and one of the great things is having structures there to get yourself out of it mm. it's like the happiness equation mo, mo Gordat talks about it he was like do i get sad or pissed off he's like all the time but he was like i've got an average of about seven seconds i can get myself out of it and it's a similar thing to like that isn't it you yeah. think do you have a framework to get yourself out of it and, because this is something that I'm really started to learn over the last couple of years and Owen's helped me a lot of this is just getting yourself out of that and yep. being like, here we are, embody the role, you're here for a reason. Yep. And even if it doesn't go right, you're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know? I'm going to get a little bit tangential here, but there's a, I don't know if you know the book, the Bhagavad Gita, yeah. which is... Yeah, um, I love it. Yeah, 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 right. So I think when I was in my 20s, I must have read that book a couple hundred times mm -hmm. trying to figure out what 
fuck it was about. Yeah. <laughs> Funny story about the Bhagavad Gita. I got given it on the street, actually. Oh, yeah? Crazy. Yeah, it was a guy who dra- yeah. dragged a trolley around and he, he was handing out the books. Yeah. And um, it was at a time when I was kind of getting into a bit of Buddhism and yoga and stuff like this. And uh, he was like, do you want these books? I had no idea what they were. Yeah. I gave him $50 for the books. I'm like, yep, I'll take him $50. Nice. Changed my life. Yeah. Amazing, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway. Well, look, I mean, the Bhagavad Gita... Like for if anyone's listening and they they don't know what it is, is a basically it's a really long form poem which is part of a a series of stories from um, a massive series of scripts from um, fuck I don't even know whether it's Hinduism or anyways from India basically Sanskrit stuff isn't so, it? Yeah, yeah it was goes way back and and this particular story is um, about this dude who is a is a, a warrior prince and. He's having a fucking situation where he's about to go into battle and he's kind of doubting himself because, you know, the people that he can see, they're like his people. They're his cousins. And he's like, fuck, I've got to go and fight them. They're my enemies, but they're my cousins. And he's having this big, massive dialogue with Krishna, who's God or whatever, or his experience of, you know, the divine or the the fucking immense or whatever. And it's this kind of really interesting story where he he the, the conclusion is man it doesn't matter whether you do it or don't do it but it is your role and responsibility in this moment to be the warrior prince and to fight that's it right so fucking think what you like about it be as scared as you like doubt yourself as much as you want but you're going to go and fight mm. Because you are the warrior prince right now. Go fuck off and fight. Yeah. Kind of, a, I guess, a modern day way of saying that is just that be present, isn't it? You yeah. know, be present right now. Yeah. What you have is right now. Yeah. You've got to do what you got to do right now. Yeah. And like, again, Mo Gordat says that he's got this sort of thing of time. He was like, all you have is right now. Mm. Tomorrow will be right now for you. Exactly. Yesterday was also right now for you, you know, and, and practicing that. Yeah. When I heard it said in that way, because we've all heard live in the now. You what know, does that mean? Be present. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, but like, I get yeah. it. It's not that easy though. But then when someone says, all you ever have is right now, because yeah. any time you're in is right now. Yeah. It's like, aha. And, and all you can focus. do, right? All you can do is what you're doing right now. Um, there's a great book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Have you read that book? No, no. It, there's, it's a really interesting book. Um, but basically, uh, there's a there's a there's a piece in the book where the guy's... Uh, the clutch on his motorcycle fucks out and he has to change he's, he's out on the highway and he has to uh, he has to replace the flywheel and he has this moment of zen where he realizes that the the grand goal is to get to where he's going on his motorcycle on his journey uh, but he can't go until the motorcycle works and the motorcycle can't work until he changes the clutch and he can't change the clutch until he removes the flywheel casing and he can't remove the flywheel casing until he undoes the nuts that hold it on and he can't undo the nuts until he places the socket wrench on and pulls it and he has this moment of like all I have in this moment right now is undoing a nut place the socket wrench on and he had this moment of clarity and presence right and and it was really interesting because he was having this whole head fuck story about what was going on for him in his in his emotional life but that moment was pure Zen, right? And I think for me, I feel like that when we're cutting hair, you can have these amazing moments of pure Zen when you're cutting yeah. hair. Yeah, if you're, you're present in, in your hair. And mm. you're just watching the hair and you're watching how the comb sits on the hair and how the clippers cut it off. You know what I mean? Like mm. those moments of Zen in yeah. in cutting hair are there. Anyway, in fact, that was a very random fucking sidetrack to go oh, it was good I, I had that <laughs> I had a powerful moment like that um 2019 I won the uh, Australian Barber of the Year in, in Brisbane yeah <laughs> but that's besides the point but the whole process of like getting there I I was on a bit of a crusade that year I flew from Melbourne to Brisbane on my own spent the whole thing on my own um but I really come to a point in my skill set and skill stacking I guess where I was almost observing myself doing it and I was deadly present and it was just something came over me and I just knew that I had all the skills ready and it was that just absolute zen I was like here's the clipper this is exactly what it does this is is exactly what I want it to do and it just all happened 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 and then that was the first time I really observed like I come out of it like that was some crazy flow state as well because Mm. I've done the work that I did there I've never did before and I've never done it again it's just some shit that just was like 
It came out of my head, you know, because nice. the model, the model that I had, I'd sourced through a, a client. It was a client's cousin and all this stuff. Never seen his hair, and I'm, I just needed one thing. And I've worked out that my creativity works the best when I don't have parameters, and well, that's when I have least anxiety. And I said how do you feel? Can I do whatever I want? He said, do whatever you want. I said, that's all I need to know. <laughs> and then, Epic. boom. And it was that moment of like, one thing at a time. Mm. Here's the clipper. This is what it does. And mm. then, yeah, magic happened. It that's was great. magic. That yeah. is super magic, man. Yeah. That flow state's really interesting, eh? Because, you know, you, they talk about it in sport where some people seem as though they have more time mm. than other players on the field. Or, you know, that it seems like things are going slower for them or they mm. can see things more clearly mm. and you have moments of that magic right when you're in that flow state mm. i feel like i get that with hair sometimes like do you ever when you actually slow down in order to speed up like you slow down the process and then you look at the, t the clock and you're like oh i've got five minutes at the end mm. of the service but when you're actually always thinking and worried about the time running out yeah you're always running late mm. always yeah. always yeah yeah because what you're doing is you're putting your focus on the time rather than the task. Yeah. 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 Man, uh, interesting, just going to that point of skill stacking, you know, like when you shoot a collection and you want to win an award, you, you know, you have to, you have to have a, a different set of skills, right? Part of it is your hair cutting skills and your hair coloring skills. But then you also have to produce a shoot. And producing a photo shoot is a skill unto itself. That's a whole job. Mm. Like that's a person's job. Yep. Mm. Then there is the art direction or creative direction of the photo shoot itself. That's a whole other job. That's a whole person's job, right? In agency land, there's one person, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And I think when we do photo shoots for our industry stuff, like to win awards, we think, okay, we're the hairdresser, we're going to do these haircuts and we're going to pull the team together and that. But we, we don't realize that there's all of these kind of separate still skills that we have to skill stack not like that buzzword <laughs> um, you know like okay yes you've got to do the hair you've got to be the creative director you've got to concept the shoot you've got to produce the shoot you've got to run the team and that's another skill altogether right like leadership is a skill and there yeah. are specific uh, techniques and methods you can learn to lead effectively mm -hmm. and so if you think about just putting together a photo shoot for a competition, there's a whole bunch of different things that you have to do separate to doing the haircuts and styling the hair. Yeah. Right. We always talk about that. Like, I think that's what in our sighted industry, like we genuinely feel like that's why we're in the position that we're in. It's, it's not because of the haircutting. Like there's people who can do better haircuts than us. But like when you add it all up, mm. and you put it all together in the mm. blender, and it's like what you get out of that greater than the sum of its parts, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, and it's almost like the stuff. It's like the tip of the iceberg stuff. Yeah, that's what people see. Yeah, but like what goes into that, like mm. what's beneath the surface there, yep. is massive. You and know? some people have a bigger tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you listen to a couple of podcasts ago, Jamie Farland's got a, was saying about the bigger tip. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jamie, who's got the bigger tip? <laughs> You're Richard. Uh, you know, like I feel the same way, man. Like, uh, not about my tip, but uh, <laughs> like uh, the thing is, there are there are way better hairdressers than me technically, but. I've got this kind of base, this broad base of skills that allows me to kind of do all the other aspects of the job that are required mm -hmm. that mean that, you know, um, because I can, you know, I can pull together a team, I can lead a team, I can communicate effectively, I can articulate a vision. You know, I've kind of got all of those skills from all the other shit that I've learned doing all this other stuff and working mm -hmm. it with all these different teams and understanding all the different roles and the skills that are required, learning them, picking them up. Um, on that note, I rem I'm reminded, we, we were talking a little while ago about uh, imposter syndrome. When I was in uh, King Kong, my stomach's rumbling. I don't know if they can hear that on the microphone. <laughs> um, when I was in King Kong, do you know Peter Jackson, the film director, mm. yeah. uh, uh, and the movie King Kong? Yeah. Right? So I was in King Kong and I was um, one of the sailors of the ship that went to the island to try and rescue the girl when the ape stole the girl and I got killed by a dinosaur. Uh, and I was there for four months working every day with fucking Academy Award winning actors on set doing scenes with them. 
and it was an incredible experience. One day, I'm sitting out in the courtyard with uh, Adrian Brody. Um, he's an actor. Actually, he taught me the best Hungarian phrase ever, which is lofas a shagedbe. And if anyone's Hungarian listening to this, they will know exactly what that means. And I will tell you guys off air. It is incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. The best curse ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sitting out in the sun with Adrian and I might be conflating these two chats, but his mum was there. And I had, uh, at the time, I didn't have my full Japanese uh, tattoo. I just had some other tattoos on my arm. And so every day I would go into makeup, they would cover up my tattoos and then they would put on uh, like 1908 tattoos and like hand tattoos. My, my character was Jackie Lucky Knuckles and I was a, I was a fighter from Ireland. You know, yeah. he's Jackie Lucky Knuckles and I'll fuck you up if you fucking look at me. You... <laughs> like that. Fuck. Um, and so I had these tattoos, on fake tattoos on my knuckles and other fake tattoos on my arms. And Adrian's mum was like, oh, how do you find it working as an actor with those tattoos on your hands? <laughs> what? They're not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, at that, we're sitting around shooting the shit in the sun, sitting on the beanbags in between scenes. And the production assistant comes over and says, producer wants to see you. And my sphincter just clenched up like that because I'm like, fuck it. Every time one of the production team or management would come over to talk to me, I would, I was convinced that they were going to say, listen, Rich, I'm really sorry, mate, but it's just not working out. You're kind of like, we're going to have to let you go home early. Because I had a contract for four months, right? But I kept thinking every single day that they were going to send me home. I kept thinking every single day that I was ruining it for everyone else because I didn't know what I was doing and I had no right to be there. And I was like, I'm fucking this up for everybody. I shouldn't even be here. I don't, why, I'm not an actor. I fucking, what am I doing? You know, I'm just going to mm. ruin this thing. And it's a, it was a, at the time, it was the biggest budget film in the world. It was like 300 million or something like that. Um, and anyway, the producer, I th the producer said, uh, the, the assistant said, producer wants to see you. And I went to stand up and said, oh no, Adrian. And, and so my sphincter relaxed and, <laughs> and Adrian, you know, Adrian, uh, had just won the Academy Award for best actor for his role in the pianist. So he was literally at that moment, the best actor in the world. He had the trophy. He had the plaque. <laughs> He was it. <laughs> he was the best actor in the world, and he's a f he is a phenomenal actor, diligent, hardworking, dedicated to the craft, like focused, like really, really good, really good, um, and like no ego, just like a super amazing dude. Anyway, he comes back, sits down, and we pick up our conversation. I'm like, fuck, dude, I'm so glad that was you because every time I feel like they're going to send me home, he's like. Man, every time he goes, every time the producer wants to talk to me, I feel like they're going to send me home because I'm fucking up the film. And I'm like, you do realize, mate, you are like, you are the best actor in the world. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, I, I, he goes, honestly, every time they want to talk to me that I, I think that's it. My career's over. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment, you know, like it doesn't matter what accolades you reach. Like this is, we were talking about, like you said before, like it doesn't seem like I have imposter syndrome, but what I do have is a really healthy respect for the fact that everybody has imposter syndrome at some point in your mm -hmm. life. If you're not truly expert, even if you are truly expert at something, like my other one session stylist of the year five times, I turn up at work some days and I think, why have they hired me? <laughs> Haven't they seen my work? Mm. I'm fucking shit. You know, some mm. days I feel like that. Yeah. Mm. But I do understand that everybody feels like that. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it's, there's been times in my career where I've looked at my portfolio and I've gone, oh, fuck, this is so, why would anybody hire me? Like, mm. this is shit. And yet I've got a massive portfolio, mm. you know, mm. I, I look at like, I look at Vogue covers I've shot and think, fuck, you know, did they, did they, can they see? That's horrible mm. what I've done. Mm. Mm. But I think there's a double-edged sword, right? So I, I come from New Zealand. We have uh, a tall poppy syndrome that Australians have no idea how intense tall poppy syndrome is in New Zealand. 
it's mm. like we think we have it here go to new zealand bro the all blacks the winningest team in world sporting history their coach uh one of their, their past coaches the winningest coach in world sporting history the all blacks would go and play a game of rugby union against an overseas team they would win the game but it might be a tough battle because mm. the opponents are also very close to yeah. the best in the world the new zealand media would slam them and slam the coach because any error that they made, any mistake that they made, regardless of the fact that they won, they wouldn't celebrate the win. Mm -hmm. They'd just slam them for all their faults and failures. And that's part of the culture in New Zealand. And so there's a double-edged sword to that, right? Like on the one hand, it can be really like quite hard because you're under the spotlight. But on the other hand, what it does is it forces many of us, particularly creatives, to strive for a level of excellence that is like beyond your immediate surrounds right so we've always looked outside and looked at who is the very very so i look at guido and eugene and uh um uh um uh, uh julian dees and you know guys who are like absolute legends like the vidal sassoons of our time mm -hmm. and i look to them for my benchmark and so if i'm not reaching that benchmark i'm so hard on myself for mm -hmm. it right Rather than looking around me at my local community and going, that's my benchmark. Yeah. No, that's my benchmark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what keeps you going. I think, you know, it, it keeps tying back for me is like nurturing the kind of human side first of yourself, you know, like having that in your, always coming back to the fact that you wake up every morning. I'm the same as anyone else. I want to get to that. But even if I don't get to that, I'll fall somewhere close mm. and I'll still be arguably the best at what i do here in my world you know but there's also like you know um that idea of like um ranking yourself or categorizing yourself or saying you know like i i don't like i don't rate or rank myself right like i know the level of skill that guido has is inspiring to me um but there are things about the way he runs his career that i wouldn't do mm. i would do very different in fact i do do very differently mm. You know, um, there are things about other people's careers and skills that I really admire, but there are things about them that I'm like, I wouldn't do that that way because mm. that's not, I don't aspire to be like that as a person, as a human or as a leader or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> I think when it comes to setting your goals, right, your goals have got to be extrinsic and intrinsic, right? External and internal. What do, um, and, and this kind of comes back to the martial arts thing, right? Like, so there's two parts to this. One is, uh, learning how to learn and to learn how to learn, you have to make incremental improvements at skills each and every day, right? So that's an external thing, right? Learn a skill, make an, a small incremental improvement, right? If you're working in the salon and you're cutting hair and you want to get better at skin fades, then you just, you know, it's, it's not going to be perfect at first, right? It's not going to look like a retouched airbrushed photo from an award-winning campaign at first, but slowly, incrementally, you might get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better every day, every time you do that haircut, if you're focused on getting a little bit better. And that's a skill. By building that skill and by getting incrementally better every day, what you also do is you build your own personal resolve or your, you do your inner work, right? So you've got your extrinsic goal, your intr intrinsic goal. Your intrinsic goal has got to be also about checking and monitoring yourself so that you're not necessarily looking to be recognized or you know be um lauded or you know get the like have smoke blown up your ass and you know fucking whatever like it's nice to receive accolades because it's like enables you to kind of go okay that was a goal i measured it i got there it's a measure and an accolade but at the same time if you're looking to have smoke blown up your ass so that you can think you're great and think you made it you're never going to fucking get there because every goal you reach is never going to be enough. No matter what you achieve, you're always going to feel slightly dissatisfied inside unless the art of learning is what's going to drive you and satisfy you, you know? So learning how to learn and then that's going to build an internal, mm. like an internal strength and depth that satisfies you beyond the external. Yeah. Right? When you have that, you Incredible. don't even care. Like that actually sums up literally everything that we've experienced in the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. so the ahfa finalists came out 
<laughs> Lee didn't final for for men's hairdresser. We thought yeah, he would. I put a collection in. We um, were almost certain. massive learning. The whole thing that you were just explaining was yeah, huge learning curve for mm. me mm. in terms of like skill stacking and mm. yeah. so something that I loved like hearing you say there, keeping that that ridiculous audacious goal like is great because something that I'm seeing and this is maybe where we all have a similarity is like I like to stay just there, mm. you know. I, I really, you know in my head I'm like wow oh, it'd be great to be hairdresser of the year but one time but then it'd be like do I really want it mm. no because then then what yeah yeah and, and it's for me it's, I love that you said that it's the tip of the hat thing it's mm. like it's a measure right? it's nice it's it's a measure. Measure. you've yes. got a trophy yeah. on the shelf shelf, and it's nice and you can look at it from time to time and go yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I've got a whole bunch of them nice. out there exactly. and, I, and, I, and I walk past them. I, I've got a whole bunch of trophies that I threw away when I, when I was younger and I, I yeah. really regret that because I would love. I love looking at my trophies now and just going. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Like because you know, you never think you're good enough, right? And I think don't think I. I think even people who think that they're fucking amazing actually don't think that they're good enough, mm-hmm. really. And I think that's just part of us as humans, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. sometimes it's nice to look at those trophies and mm-hmm. go, "Oh yeah, yeah. I did all yeah. right." Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And just to go back to that story about like the last mm-hmm. few weeks, like so that happened, and then a week later we did that modern barber awards and we basically like we basically cleaned up there we did everything we could do yeah right you know lee got barber of the year um we won <laughs> best team collection lee won messy uh men's classics uh collection Ooh. and i got the special recognition award as well <clears throat> so it was Epic. but then it was kind of like okay great to get the recognition and then going to the last night's awards it was almost like we were up for education right and then we didn't get it and it was almost like okay um cool like but we're just really happy to be here and we don't it's it's about the feeling inside first yep and knowing that like if we don't get uh, acknowledged in that moment mm. it doesn't change our course whatsoever no. it's just nice it's a test and measure thing again it's almost like okay well we didn't meet the requirements this time yeah but it doesn't change how i feel as a human it exactly. doesn't define yeah. me yeah. at all yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've had this this morning we were just chatting about it about last night we were just like well we've grown a lot you know yeah. at one point in our lives even just a couple of years ago we would have maybe thought that everything that happened last night w- meant more yeah you know? yeah, yeah yeah but it, yeah. like to to me as a person like internally now like doing that intrinsic work as i'm skill stacking on the extrinsic it's like I've, I've built all these skills up to the point where I'm like really content now, like mm. with where I'm moving. Because mm. the you skills are, reco- are, are, are um, rewarding, right? Like yeah. learning is rewarding. Oh, it's Growing awesome. is rewarding. Mm. And like, like you say, like putting in a submission, being a finalist, the process of doing that, even for people who don't make finalists, right? Like being a finalist, you might as well win if you're a finalist because having judged multiple awards across multiple platforms for all different criteria and category. The difference between one and four is so marginal mm. and it, and, and it, and it, it could be like nothing. Yeah. Right. Mm. It could literally just be like a drop of water either side to tip the balance, like nothing. Yeah. Um, so to me to find, to be a finalist in a category is, is, as good as winning mm. it, right? Like, yeah, you don't get the trophy and you don't get to do the speech. Yeah. But to know that you did the work to be the equivalent of those peers, mm. right? You might as well be there as well. But to me, even if you don't make that finalist level, to do the work of creating a submission for awards is a massive, massive achievement that will take you, any of you people that are listening if you're thinking about a way to grow yourself in your career as a hairdresser entering awards regardless of the outcome will take you exponentially ahead in your own personal growth your career growth your understanding of the process and your learning of who you are and where you are at the moment Mm. when i had my first boxing fight the night before my first boxing fight, one of the journeymen from our gym who'd had like, I don't know, 75 fights or something, never said a word to me in all the years that I was training <laughs> at the gym. And the night before my first fight, he came up, he put his arm around me and he goes, on you, mate. Uh, listen, win, lose or draw. You will have stepped into the ring 
you would have fought in combat hand to hand with another man, regardless of the outcome. Not many people have done that and no one can ever take that experience away from you. I was like, it's powerful. You've never said a word to me. You've just been over there with your fucking dirty mullet in the bag <laughs> for hours on yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mad though, isn't it? Like having that kind of mindset around it. Like we, we try to really kind of instill this framework of thinking with the younger people that we encounter in the industry yeah. now and in our own team and it's not about the result it's about the process of the result and like of getting there even mm-hmm. if you don't get that result that you want it's like the expectation versus reality thing there but like even like me and my missus we did this um thing the other day where it was like it's a purpose exercise mm-hmm. so you go through the exercise to to find your purpose you mm-hmm. know and there was all these questions and she was there's like a list of seven or eight questions on question four she's like i've answered this like twice but just in a different way and it's like yes but continue the exercise because when you get to the end it all makes sense it's like the art of making the motorcycle you know mm. it's like you can't focus on riding the bike yet you're still putting the fucking nuts and bolts yeah, exactly in, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and then once you get there then we can focus on riding the bike that's a know? good point man don't you think so many people do that like they're focusing on like they're doing something but they're focusing on the outcome mm. Rather than the process, right? Yeah, and then it like when it crumbles or something. Like yeah. say, for example, if it is something that requires structure, yeah, and they just fucking go to the foundation or the outside first. They start putting the the glass on the outside of the building without the foundation. It's gonna fall down. Like it's, yeah, yeah. Um, what's your purpose? What's my purpose? Yeah, you just did a purpose exercise. Yeah, so we, we we actually did a really great yeah, purpose we had a exercise. Good one for the, yeah, we yeah. did a really good day two weeks ago. Yeah. Like I said, um, we. I told you earlier this morning, I'm doing um, a mastermind year. Um, so I got like a business mastermind uh, course. And in that, like really everything stems from the purpose. So like you have your purpose, then you have your mission. And, you know, like I touched on in a few podcasts recently as well, you know, key the key to the door for us is hair. Mm. I think our purpose and my purpose as well, my personal purpose is to like build and inspire lives through mm. hair. Mm. Nice. And it's true hair. It doesn't have to be hair. Mm. You know, like our last guest on the, on the podcast yesterday, he he uh, came to one of our courses earlier in the year and afterwards he stepped away from the industry a couple of months later. We kind of wanted to understand why. Mm. But, you know, we're encouraging the person and the growth and maybe that's the season he has to he has to take that road for now. That's yep. the season he has to go. And that was and inspiring his life through her. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. And we, we helped like we encouraged that in him, you know. We didn't mm. say, Oh no, you need to just stay working in the shop and like doing twenty cuts a day because that's what matters, you know. Because mm. it's is it though, that's for not him? what matters for him, no. right? No, yeah, not yeah, for him. No. Um so that's our like that's my purpose and amazing. I always thought like my purpose was kind of to share my mindset, like you know, there's so much stuff that you talk about that we can resonate with. Mm. Um, and it's very inspiring to hear because there's not many people really think like this. Mm. And it's like, it's so encouraging for so, us. Something I was, yeah, going to say, like, have you, how have you felt that in your career? Like, has it been a struggle to kind of get that message across? Or do you feel like you're not getting anywhere with it? Or like, because... Man, yeah, you know what, to be honest, I think like, so my when I first met my wife, she was a fashion photographer and she worked in a studio with these other photographers, one of whom was the first photographer I ever worked with, right? I I walked into the studio one day when they were having a conversation and the first words she said to me, I'd never met her before and they were in the midst of this kind of conversation about uh, purpose and life and uh, mission and she she said to me, oh, hello, Uh, we're just having a conversation. Do you think it's your responsibility to uh, be a leader and a teacher? And I was like, it's funny you should ask that. I do have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my opinion is this, man. Um, my opinion is that, you know, in our own way, we're all an example uh, to other people, right? Some, someone else. Like when you're a toddler, a baby's look at you and go, oh, my God, that's a big boy. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you're a three-year-old doing three-year-old shit, fucking picking your nose and eating it. The baby's looking at you going, I want to be you. You're amazing. And you don't even know it, right? And so I think that um, for me, uh, uh, leadership is more about exemplifying what I believe to be right for me. And if how I live resonates with you, 
Like if you can see congruence, if you can sense, um, you know, mission and purpose and congruence in, in living the way that I believe is the right way to live. And if that inspires you and you want to talk to me about it, 100%, right? Mm. But I, I, I'm, not really, I'm not really driven to amplify that. Mm, if yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. right? So I'm driven if to exemplify to you, rather than yeah. If it comes to you, and we we always say that, and it's like yeah. that's yeah. the that's the upsetting thing. Like for us, when we don't like say last night when we didn't win education, like that's one thing we would have probably said in our speech. It's like, look, it's not about what we do with the award and put it on the shelf. It's it's what we do next and how we show up as an example. Because you can you show up as an either example or or a warning sign, you know? Exactly. I'm just um, going to text my wife who's just pulled into the garage next to us to say, shush, when you come through, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I better tell her, look at this, I'm typing recording, a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> ah, please it's okay. walk. It's all good. We can cut it quietly. Yeah, it's all good, I don't yeah. reckon cut it, just leave it in there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> leave it. Uh, she'll come what, through here what in the a kids minute. kids want, eh? Yeah, yeah. Love uh, music. It's uh, <laughs> all good. It's rock and roll but you know i think that that um there's a there's a there's a part to this right so we're, we're talking about these kind of quite abstract concepts of you know being present being present learning how to learn sort of in subtly we're we're touching on this idea of 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 goal setting and achieving goals and reaching goals and stuff yes uh, you can come through i just text saying we're recording a podcast so don't say anything but walk through quietly <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, the subtle idea of, of, uh, of, of goal setting and doing intrinsic work to help you with your own personal growth in the moment that you're in, right? Like living your life with purpose allows you to grow as a human. But something I've learned really recently um, in my latest venture, my latest role as a tech CEO of a tech company randomly um <laughs> is that the, the kind of there's a structure to this to this process of leadership and this process of doing and mm. achieving and creating and hello you can come through we've just said that we're you know recording a podcast and i've told you that we're we're doing it so we're going to leave this in as well you're walking through <laughs> can you shut that door though on the way through thanks <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, the dog's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's going to knock on the door and try and yeah. get out and follow them as yeah. well. Um, oh, no, he's but, coming back. So here's this thing that I've learned, right? Which is like, <laughs> um, there's a structure, and the structure for me goes like this: vision, strategy, plan, execution. Right. Mm -hmm. So you got to have a vision, mm -hmm. and this goes for anything, like whether you're. Uh, whether you're doing a haircut, whether you're building a business, whether you're entering a competition, or or whether you you know you're just like doing a project of any kind, you have to have a, a strategy, an overarching strategy. What's what am I trying to achieve here, and how mm -hmm. am I going to go about it? What's the roadmap? Where am I going? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay, what I want to achieve is this. I want to solve these problems in this way and then from that strategy you can create a plan okay and i use a, a planning tool called a pert chart which is kind of like you build flagstones to get to your goal but rather than build them from where you are to where you want to go you build them from where you want to go backwards yeah. to where you are reverse engineer yeah Robert. yeah so you go i want to get there what has to happen so so okay i'm going to be fucking audacious and say this out loud i've got a tech company now which we hope to exit for a billion dollars plus yeah. and that is an audacious goal, but it's also a, an extremely achievable goal Absolutely. with what we're doing with Absolutely. our products. So you have the strategy of, right, like long term, I want to build a, a software solution to help salon professionals have more profitable businesses, create more wow moments for their clients. My mission is to use everything I've ever learned from every aspect and touch point of my career to create a process and a system that can be implemented in a digital tool so that hairdressers can thrive. It's that simple, right? That's the, that's the kind of mission. So there's a strategy behind that, which is we build a team, create software, get funding, grow it to a certain level, and then ultimately I'll sell it to someone who can do that, the, the, a better job of, yeah. of reaching more people. I have to then make a plan of how to 
execute the strategy. So uh, what's the plan? I need to hire a certain number of people. I need to, how much is that going to cost? So I need to figure out how much that's going to cost and how long it's going to take. And then I have to do a budget. And then uh, then I have to find the people. And then, you know, mm. and so then it's the, the plan. And then from the plan, I have to, to then just simply execute. Yeah. Um, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, incredible. Something that I'm really trying to work on as well is like remove a little bit of my bias out of things as well especially when trying to take, bring my kind of thoughts and the way I live and my purpose to people. Mm. Um, and something that I've learned only just recently is like for me in particular and with our business, we need to test and measure more. Uh-huh. And in that, in that yeah. thing that you just said, I reckon you can throw one more in there, test and measure yeah. from what works and what doesn't. And then that just fast tracks the whole thing, I think. Like, so there's this thing that I learned. I learned it from um, one of my coaches, Chris Barron, who's a... Um, who's an educator in the U S in the hair industry and he's a fucking legend, such a great dude. And this thing is, is basically a debrief, right? And you can mm. use it with your team and you can use it with yourself, but it's checks and measures, yeah. right? It's, it's like assess what worked, keep what worked, what didn't work. Okay. Change what didn't work mm. for more of what does work. Now yeah. I use a really simple way of doing that because it can be overwhelming when, you think about like like so let's say for example you did let's take your submission for AHFA educator of the year right if you were going to use this exercise you would go what worked right there'd be certain things about it that you know worked mm-hmm. really well then you could ask yourself what didn't work yeah a simpler way of doing that would be to say okay what am i going to give myself a high five for what was cool what worked what am i going to keep now if i got to do this again which i will What's one thing that I would do differently to get a better outcome? Because one thing is actionable. Mm. But if you go, what, what's all the things that didn't work can be a fucking minefield and it can trip you up. And I think that's what happens to people when they do checks and measures is they get too like, oh my God, there's too many things I did wrong. And I did that a lot myself in my, in my career when I was younger. I'd just look at everything I did and think it was shit mm. rather than go, What's one thing I could do differently to make it better? Yeah. And then I can action that next time. I always say that about haircuts and I, I kind of apply the same philosophy in life. Mm. It's like I look at what's right about things rather than looking for what's wrong. Because mm. it's like that whole tall, tall puppy syndrome thing. It's like looking for what's wrong. Yep. It's just not <laughs> the way to do it, yeah. essentially. And like straight away when you, like say, for example, to go back to that um, mastermind that I'm doing, that's what, that's what they do. So... You look at your purpose first, yeah. then you set your mission, then you go to your annual plan, mm. especially as a startup, mm. right? We're mm. more or less a startup. So then with our annual plan, we break that, we see that as a pie. You break that down into four pieces mm. and then you have your quarterly tactical operating priorities. Nice. Within that, them quarterlies, then it gives you your weeklies. Yeah. And when you set your five goals for the week, yeah, like if they're not meeting that quarter, then you're doing the wrong stuff. You're mm. thinking too far ahead. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's the way we kind of break it down yes. at the moment. But up to this point, it's kind of just been like, ah, oh, we're a COVID baby, you know, as a business, <laughs> we'll just start, <laughs> we'll see how we go. Yeah. But straight away, when they do debriefing as well with us mm. in, in this course, and it's like, straight away, when you actually say that about our submission, there's so many things I can think of that could have done better. Like, I just kind of put it together. Yeah. And like, even from a visual standpoint, that's one thing we could have done better. Right. Visually, we could yeah. have presented it better. Okay, there you go. And then that if could you be the difference between winning and losing. A hundred percent, a hundred percent could be the difference between winning and losing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and it's funny, flip the whole thing on the head. You know, you're saying looking what's right for things. I love the Peter Crone thing. Have you heard of Peter Crone? No. Fantastic. He's like the one thing to remember is we don't actually know what's right. Yeah. <laughs> Something in the back of the mind is like, yeah. you know what? In the end. No one fucking knows, <laughs> you know, and that's a good humility practice as well. It's like, you know, 100%. and that's where I was going with trying to like remove my bias from things. It's yeah. like, uh, this is what I think and this is what works mm. for me. Tested and measured in a certain way, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be to this yeah. point. But in the end, I really don't know. Down. So nobody does. But it's also <laughs> like being willing to be wrong, right, mm. is important. Oh, man. I so think, powerful. Especially when you're, when, when you're, you know, when you're trying to uh, create something new, being willing to be wrong is super important. Mm. Yeah, you have to fail. Yeah. Like you have and to. That, and it's like testing your conditioning is hard. Mm. You know, like 
going against the grain like of your conditioning yeah. is, is sometimes well, difficult. That, that was with my collection um yeah the other week when we were, I, we interviewed jack morton and jamie ferlan and i just gave it to them i said brutal honest opinion do not hold back you know i can handle it i want yeah. it you know yeah. and it was great and uh, yeah and they gave me some great feedback so yeah I, nice yeah. and just yeah. but that that's that's taken a long time to get there but that humility to just be like you know what all right but you know, hit, Mr. It, Mark, it right? sounds cliche as well, but it's like if you're not willing to to take them hits and take the failures, you're not willing to actually go and get that billion dollars either. No, you know? exactly. It's like you, you have well, to. I'll go back to up. fighting, right? Like you want to win a fight, you're going to get punched in the face. Mm. You better fucking get used to getting punched in the face because mm. that's a normal part mm. of fighting. And in everyday life, having like, I just you know, it, it's important that you're resilient enough and humble enough and willing enough to take feedback because if you truly want to grow you need to hear what's wrong take it how can i use that to improve mm. and that's like an ego test too when yeah. you hear what's wrong it's almost like every single day you're building that resistance but on. you also got to remember like fucking nobody's going to really see it like yeah. there's eight billion people in the world and yeah, nobody really cares as well like <laughs> yeah not like some people are going to see what you do and really love it Right, some people are going to see what you do, and it's not for them. They're not going to like it. The reality is, out of the eight billion people on the planet, most people are going to have no idea that you even exist. So it doesn't really matter. Just That's give it a exactly crack. Exactly how I look at all of this. I'm like, you know, in the end, yeah. <laughs> there's eight billion people on the planet. There's going to be plenty of people that don't care. Yeah, yeah, incredible. No, absolutely. So, what? Where do you see um, our industry going next? Yeah, it's a good question, man. Um, I I do think that there's some big changes happening in our industry, not so much in the what we do and how we do it, but more in the kind of structures, um, or the commercial structures of how it works. And I think if you look at historically, you look at the music industry and how that changed through a digital revolution. Um, you look at the fashion industry and how that's changed. Look at how retail's changed. Look at how media, like modern media, film, television, changed dramatically um i was lucky enough to be working alongside uh um, a couple of big bands at the start of the digital era of music and watching the the labels tumbling through space like psychologically emotionally mentally struggling to figure out how to make sense of an industry inverting where the traditional power structures of Here's a label. We've got all the money and the contacts and the power. The only way you can reach an audience is through us and we will control the narrative all the way from top to bottom and the money and everything. And the artist was at the bottom of the pyramid to a complete flip of that where artists can just sit in their room like this, make music yeah. and broadcast it to the world and have yeah. the world come direct to them and purchase their product. And, and you know, I saw that happening firsthand. I was involved in conversations with people, you know, like at the top of the food chain in the music industry when that was happening. It was really interesting. Likewise, that's recently happened in, you know, print media with magazines and fashion and, and so forth. And again, you know, I've been involved in that industry very close to people who have had the traditional structures of media uh, inverting where the individual user becomes the source of content and information and entertainment as opposed to, you know, a single source. Um, and, you know, likewise with film and television, I was involved in that industry at the time that it was inverting. And so my, my what I see for our industry, for the hair industry, is there are similar signs of the traditional structures of the way that the business model works are uh, eroding. There are similar signs of the model eroding like those other mm. industries. What that ultimately looks like, I don't know. Nobody really knows. But what I see is a much more egalitarian space. Um, I see the individual hairdresser as the... Um, uh, I guess the, the the intellectual property or the commodity, if you like, as opposed to what traditionally was a salon. Mm -hmm. You know, consumers would find a salon to go to, and then in the salon they would find the services that they want. I think the the inverse is happening now, where people are looking for a person. 
that can give them the types of services and vibe that they mm -hmm. want. And with social media and technology and mobile phones and the ability to connect with an audience directly, the traditional structures are somewhat changing. And I think for you guys as leaders and educators, having an awareness of that and being on the edge of being able to help navigate a new um, uh, a new era of business, mm -hmm. I think that's where the big changes are happening. Absolutely. Okay. We're, we're talking about that kind of stuff all of the yeah. time. And I think like what really needs, in my opinion, to be, I guess, h highlighted more or worked on more from the very beginning of somebody's career in here is their personal branding. Yeah. And it goes beyond the logo and it goes beyond the color scheme and it goes yeah. beyond all that stuff because that's all the extrinsic stuff. It's yeah. like, you know, the reason why all of these brands approach you to be them the brand voice and do all that is because of your personal branding that you've created for yourself mm. as well as the skill stacking on top of that too. They don't look at you just as this is the person who cuts hair and mm. does hair and moves you on at that, I think. Yeah, it's a persona, right? Like mm. it's a, it's a, and it's not, a persona is not something you put on. A persona is something you 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 uh, you strip away the the external stuff to display who you truly are, and like who you are is is oh fuck man my mate Chris Cole's amazing photographer I used to work with him a lot he said to me one day I I showed him this um this this uh, hair that I'd done for uh, Vogue China it was this like wicked cascading waterfalls of like it was four and a half hours of hair prep blow drying and setting and extensions and blow drying and setting and over and over again and placing the hair and it was so like technically epic i was so proud of myself and he was like yeah i was like what do you mean man he's yeah. like well do you like it and i'm like oh yeah but you know it took me four and a half hours and look how no like you know look here's the here's the polaroid and then here's the finished look and everything's done in camera and it's not retouched and, and he's like yeah but do you like it like the question is do you like it is it is it you is it your personal style is it something that you look at and go damn that's wicked i love that he said, there's a difference between being impressed with yourself for pulling off something that you thought was hard and actually liking what you did. Mm. And if you can find more of the, do you like it moments, then you'll have more personal creative satisfaction. You'll have more business satisfaction because you'll just be doing the sort of work you want to do. Mm. And there's enough for us, like to back to that point of the, 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 the kind of traditional structures changing. There's enough for us all to thrive, right? If we just do the type of work that we want to do. Who are you as a person? What's your personal vibe? What sort of music do you like? What do you like to wear? What do you like to look at? What do you like to talk about? What sort of people do you vibe on? When you sit down with somebody and you have a conversation, what sorts of conversations make you come away feeling energized, what Absolutely. sorts of conversations make you come away feeling like, oh, shit, that was hard work. Mm. I'm tired. I don't really mm. want to do that again, right? Yeah. Do the shit that powers you, man. Do the shit that energizes you. Do the shit that makes you go, I want more of that. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what your personal brand is. Absolutely. Mm. And I think, that, you know, sometimes it's, accept sometimes, in my opinion, in the hair industry, we just accept situations for what they are rather than trying to create a different normal for ourselves. Mm. You know, in that regard, it's almost mm. like, oh, well, this is just how it is. Mm. Like, I have to do, do these and have these conversations mm. and do these haircuts because, yeah, there is there is something in the learning of doing them. 100%. Because you have to learn that you don't 100%. like that. You yeah. don't know until you try it, you know? And also, I'm going to say this, man, like, while you're doing that, it's a fucking marathon, not a sprint, right? Like... You have, you cannot bypass the fundamentals. One thing I learned from martial arts, you cannot bypass the fundamentals and every day you have to practice fundamentals. Mm. Yeah. I have thrown a straight punch, a straight punch, thousands and thousands and thousands of times. I'm 52 years old. Every day I sit down here, I shadow box, basics, jab, basics, cross, yeah. hook, uppercut, yeah. footwork fundamentals i'm not fighting anymore but i still to keep yeah. myself sharp fundamentals in hairdressing you cannot Same bypass thing. it and you can't fucking rush it you can't go from zero to italian vogue in six months mm -hmm. right no it's like the, it's the, the basics when you do the basics right i think like this is the, the funny thing i feel about my skill set as a, as a barber or a hairdresser like i don't even look at myself as the nowhere near the best when it comes to that stuff but 
I just do the basic stuff. I focus on doing that yeah. right, you know, yeah. and the rest comes yeah. together. There's so much in there what you said. There's one guy in particular that I'm thinking of in our team who I'm really trying to help with this mindset and you explained it beautifully. He, he's trying to do the things that seem hard. He's trying to get good at the things that seem hard. He's not doing the things that he enjoys. Mm-hmm. And I've said to him, I said, the change I think you're going to have, you've got, you know, all the skills. He can repeat back to us like a script, what Amazing. we to teach and learn and, and, and show. He knows all the things, all the technical stuff, but it, I think it's going to be in the head. That's going to take him to the next level. Yeah. Like big time. Yeah. My um, wife and I have a, a, a kind of a, catchphrase for lack of a better way of putting it but we talk about following the charm Mm. does this charm you and that that's our kind of little shorthand for does it does it light you up inside and make you feel like that's the that's the thing i want to do Mm. do you have Mm. a desire for it not because of any external goals accolades rewards anything but inside does it turn you on Yeah. yeah and if you can follow the charm man yeah fucking you're winning every day. Absolutely. Nothing else matters. Like literally nothing else matters. Yeah. Absolutely. We try and live by that. You know, we got told, what do what brings you joy. It's the same thing. You exactly. Know, what yeah, that's, you what, joy? that's how I felt last night, you know. I was just there. I enjoyed the moment. Mm. I was like, whether I'm here or not, I'm still enjoying my life equally, you know. 100%. Um, yeah. And not placing too much value in that. But so much gems there. So many gems in that conversation. <laughs> good chat, boys. Oh, very, very, great. very good chat. Um, yeah. And I'm sure there's more to come. We'll have to get episode part two of, of Richard Cavan. <laughs> yeah. There's so much we didn't even touch on, you know, like yeah. in terms of... Yeah. We'll have to tell some stories about the tech business because that's fucking... We'll do that in another story time. Yeah. Uh, there's some fucking crazy learnings I've learned there, man. But interestingly enough, I think the biggest thing I've learned just before we wrap up is that... You know, we talked about skill stacking a bunch of times here, and I'm now the CEO of a tech company. It's at the current moment, it's a $15 million company. Um, I've got 27 investors. I've got uh, uh, two of the country's biggest venture capital funds invested in my business, along with uh, the Australian tax office, R&D rebates for the development work we're doing. We're creating AI that never fucking existed before. Um, we're imagining a model that never ever existed before and we've created something that is alive. It's a thing. It works. You guys had to play with it. Mm. And you saw a, a snapshot of what's next. I didn't even show you what's next after that. Mm. It's crazy shit. But the thing that I've learned is that when you stack up those skills in the right way, your skills are totally transferable. I'm sitting at these board meetings, like I'm a fuck. I'm a hairdresser. I mean, look at me. I'm like fucking. I'm the ordinariest fucking average guy, right? And I turn up at these board meetings with these, like people who manage hundreds of millions of dollars, and I don't feel out of place. Yeah, I don't feel amazing. uncomfortable Incredible. because I have skills that are transferable, and I'm okay to say, "Hey, listen." I don't know what that means when you say that word to me. Yeah. Can you explain it to me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's what that means. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, some of these guys are talking about shit I just do not understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm happy to say I don't understand and I'm not yeah. pretending that I know anything I don't. Absolutely. That's great. Cause we, we're very like that too. It's like we, we can hold our conversation with anyone now, I think, you know, because mm-hmm. we're, you get to a certain point where you're confident enough with what you can do and you understand you have so much further to go. Yeah. And a lot of the time when you're in those rooms, like everyone else is thinking the same thing. You know, we're all just humans yeah. at the end of the day. Like, and yeah. like It's having a bit of confidence in knowing what you bring to the table as well. You know there's some shit in your head that you're like, I can equally blow their minds. <laughs> like, you well, know? Yeah. Like, yeah. A little bit of trust. Well, in that, I but, know stuff. And that, that might come with. I know stuff that other people don't know, right? Like I know stuff that those guys don't know because I've been in situations that those guys yep. have never been in. I've worked yep. backstage at the biggest fashion shows in the world. I've been in the boardrooms with the big brands when they're mm. talking about how do we bring this, you know, this brand, this vision, this product to life and to the industry. What's right with it? What's wrong with it? What's missing? I've been in those conversations. I've been at the coalface when I've been talking to hairdressers saying, you know, here's what we need to do next or here's how you do this or here's how you translate this look from that. I've heard what the hairdressers say when, you know, there's something that's being presented to them that doesn't resonate right with them. And I've heard them tell me what their objections are, that they don't have enough time, that they can't find staff. I've, you know, I've watched them working and I understand the things that Mm. 
are blind spots for them because I've been there for long enough. And these are things that those guys don't know. Yeah, the experience, you can't really teach that. You no. can only learn it. It's a marathon, bro, not a, ra- not a sprint. Absolutely, absolutely. So we always end on one question. Oh, yeah? So it's a, it's a bit of a, I guess, it's a loaded question, but it's a, it can be very simple or it can be very complex. So, uh-huh. um, and it's something that's probably the most simple question of all time, but it's a good one. Are you happy? <laughs> that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, right now, in this moment here, right now, yes, I am happy. I've, ha- I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and sometimes I'm happy and sometimes I'm sad and sometimes I'm angry and sometimes I'm scared and sometimes I'm embarrassed because I'm a fucking human. But uh, I would say I have approximately a 65% happiness ratio to those other five emotions. Yeah. So that's not bad. That's yeah. great. It's like choose. It's your moment, isn't it? I think we're all like that. We can't be... It's almost scary to think of the person who's just happy all the time like that, you know? It's like, yeah, there's something fucking cuckoo if you're just happy all the time. Right? <laughs> that, like, if you've got that ecstatic happiness all the time, there's something not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we like and to I'm live for our moments. For that. That's what we speak about a lot, yeah, you know? You trying to moments moments. happiness. Look, it's something that I, I, like, it's a great question and it's something that I'm personally quite passionate about because um, uh, I think for a lot of us men, it's hard to articulate our emotions, right? Like we can say, I have feelings. Sometimes I feel hungry, so I eat. I have feelings. Sometimes I feel thirsty, so I drink. Like, no, those are not feelings, dude. What are your fucking feelings? But it's hard for us to articulate. And I think uh, uh, this is a whole other big, I'm not going to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but, you know, I learned to identify my emotions as one of mad, sad, glad, afraid, or ashamed. Right, one of five things. I can feel one of those feelings in my body if I think about it. I'm like, oh, I feel like there's something going on for me. What is that? It's in my body. Which of those five things is it? Oh, it's that one. Mad. Oh, I'm angry. Oh, shame. That's weird. What am I ashamed about? Huh. That doesn't serve me. Gone. Mm. But I've been able to, I learned how to identify my emotions as one of five things. And I know it's very simplistic, but it works for me. And as a simple person, it appeals to my masculine kind of DNA. I feel it in my body. What is it? One of those five things. And, um, you know, the happiness one. Are you happy? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. I feel it in my cheeks (laughs) and I feel it in my chest. That's good. Awesome. It's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise. It's been good. That chat. was actually an Thank awesome you, chat. Loved it. Loved it. I felt like I was listening to your podcast the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch this one back plenty of times. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So many gems in there. So, yeah, thanks so much uh, for thanks, giving Richard. us your time, Richard. We know you're a busy man. My um, pleasure, boys. I will. Uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. We'll talk again. We'll definitely talk right. again. Yeah. Thank you.